now now we are live okay good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to the special functions and number theory seminar uh, today our speaker is dr shomuru banerji from iit gandhinagar so dr banerji did his phd from harishchandra research institute followed by a postdoc at university of hong kong with ben kane his phd advisor was kalyan chakravarti then he went to hong kong to do his postdoc with ben kane and currently he is a postdoc here uh, working with me uh, on analytic number theory and special functions so over to you shomur thanks a lot for your nice introduction and I, i want to thank our organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here so so let me share my slide now and um, just a second yeah okay it's my screen visible now okay okay so <clears throat> let me start just a second yeah so today i am going to talk on finiteness theorems with almost prime inputs and this is basically the joint work with professor bell and this work has been started around 2 years or earlier with benken at the time of postdoc at the university of hong kong okay so let's start ah just a second ah okay yeah <clears throat> so in 1621 diophantin asked that if every positive integer can be represented as a sum of four perfect squares and this question later became it are known as bessett's conjecture so the question is quite a trivial question that any number is, is it possible can be written as sum of four squares and around 1770 lagrange solved the above conjecture so the the question of uh, diophantine can be rephrased in the following fashion that the diophantine equation x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square plus x4 square equal to n is always solvable for every n belongs to n with xj belongs to z where j equal to 1 to 3 4 okay and this result is also known as four square theorem that any number can be represented as sum of four square that's why it is known as four square theorem okay <clears throat> so lagrange four square theorem can be generalized in different directions so let me come over this one by one at around similar time of lagrange edward waring proposed that four square theorem can might be generalized in a way such that every natural number so for every natural number k there exist associated natural number gk such that every number can be written as sum of kth power of gk number of variables okay okay so basically in other words so every number n is it possible to write every number n as a sum of kth power of gk number of variables so this is the thing so is it always solvable i mean this equation is it always solvable for every x y belongs to z and this problem is known as adding problem okay and in this direction the affirmative answer was given by hilbert in 1909 and this theorem was later known as hilbert waring theorem for individual k like for k equal to uh, 2 3 4 and so on the most challenging problem is that towards this direction is that to find the lower bound of gk right why why is that because suppose we have something suppose for lagrange theorem suppose for lagrange theorem we have that sum of four square represent n right so if sum of four squares represent n then automatically sum of five square also represent n because because you can take as a five variable is zero right and six variable are also zero so if you construct i mean if you have if you find the lower bound of gk then that is sufficient for us okay and in this direction of course lagrange theorem solves the case for k equal to 2 and we fitch and kempner has solved the case k equal to 3 and professor balu with 
trace and tissue as solved the case k equal to 4 and so on. Okay. <clears throat> now the question is, uh, so Lagrange theorem says you that the minimum number for k equal to 2 is 4. So of course, okay. So now the question is, so basically gk is minimum number, right? So Lagrange theorem tells us, okay, the minimum value of gk will be, so minimum value of g2 will be 4, right? So that means if we have three variables, if we take the sum of three squares, then is it always solvable? Of course not, because this is the theorem by Lagrange. Now the question is, which numbers cannot be represented as a sum of three squares, okay? And uh, this and these questions were, in, I mean, this question independently investigated by Gauss and Lagrange, uh, by Gauss and Legendre around 1796 and 1797 and so on. Okay, <clears throat> this result can be stated as the as that the equation x1 square plus x2 square plus x2 square equal to n is solvable for any x j belongs to z if and only n is not of the form 4 to the power a times 8b plus 7, where a and b are non-negative integers. This result is known as three squared theorem. Okay, so basically the number cannot be congruent to 7 mod 8 times 4 to the power a, something like that. Okay, so now in the paper of Gauss, Gauss not only has done this thing, but also remarked many fruitful results in his paper. So let, let us see one by one. First of all, Gauss himself remarked that Lagrange theorem can be, can be obtained from Gauss result quite, by quite trivial and simple argument. Okay, let us see how. So, okay, so from Gauss result, we already know that any number which is not of the form 4 to the power a times 8b plus 7 can be represented as sum of three squares. Okay, great. Now, consider a number which is not divisible by 4 first. So let us first take 4 does not divide n. Then we have either n congruence to 1 or 2 or 3 mod 4. Okay, now for n congruence to 1 or 2 mod 4, Obviously, we can write as a sum of three squares, right? Because this is not of the form 4 to the power a times 8b plus 7. Okay. And, and for that case, okay, so the number which is congruent to 1, mod, 1 or 2 mod 4, that can be written as sum of three squares. And since it can be written as sum of three squares, so as for sum of four squares, because you can consider x4 equal to 0. Great. Now for n congruence to 3 mod 4, we have, of course, n minus 1 congruence to 2 mod 4, right? So, thus n minus 1 can be written as sum of three squares, right? From Gauss theorem, because in n minus 1 is not of the form 4 to the power a times a p plus 7. So, n minus 1, you can write it as a sum of three squares and now consider x4 equal to 1. So, that's why you can write every number which is not divisible by 4 can be written as sum of four squares, okay? Great. <clears throat> now, let, let us consider the case for 4 dividing n. And in that case, uh, let n equal to 4 to the power l times n prime, where l is any, po any positive integer. And set, uh, and suppose n prime and l, the, the GCD of n prime and 4 is equal to 1. Okay. You can see that. I mean, you can consider that, right? I mean, any, any number can which is divisible by four can be written in this way, right? Okay. Now, from the previous argument, we have already seen that there exists xj such that x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square plus x4 square equal to n prime, right? Because n prime is congruence to, so in, in, in uh, I mean, four does not divide n prime, right? Since four does not divide n prime, so you can write n prime as sum of four squares, okay? Now, just multiply with, 2 to the power 12. That's it. So just multiply with 2 to the power 12 in both the sides. So you will get the solution of n in the left hand side. 
so that's how you can so so thus you can say that okay gauss theorem implies lagrange's force field so the, i think this is a very simple argument but very nice argument from gauss okay <clears throat> now uh, let's see what other other things gauss have recovered in this in his article so now the question is so what gauss has recovered so suppose r3m is the number of solution of the sum of three squares equal to m okay so gauss recovered that so gauss has told us that what will be the exact number of solutions for r3m i mean the number of solution of x x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square equal to m so let us see that so let hd uh, be the who to its class number associated to imaginary quadratic field so let me skip that part i mean let me skip that de definition but what is important is that gauss has gauss result told us that r3m is exactly equal to this thing for n congruence to 1 to mod 4 and 3 mod 8 and so on and later jacobi has found around 1834 that r4m that is the number of representation of m as sum of four squares can be written in, in this way that is the number of solution of m as a sum of four squares is equal to 8 times summation of d where d dividing m and 4 does not divide d okay <clears throat> so let's move on to the next generalization of lagrange theorem so let us now see very interesting generalization by ramanujan and this is sort of the idea from where our theory has been started i mean our our article was it initialized <clears throat> okay so what ramanujan has asked basically uh, which positive definite diagonal quaternary quadratic forms can represent every natural numbers in other words so basically ramanujan introduced some weights inside the sum of four squares so basically he considered those quadratic forms i mean the diagonal quadratic forms of the form like a1x1 square plus a2x2 square plus a3x3 square plus a4x2 square and he asked that which diagonal quadratic form can represent every positive integer okay in other words i mean for which aj this diophantine equation is always solvable for every aj okay and along this direction ramanujan claimed that there are at most 55 positive definite integral diagonal quadratic quaternary quadratic forms i mean that means in a simple word there are at most 55 number of diagonal quadratic forms that can be represented that that can represent every positive integer and not only that in the same article ramanujan has also given the complete list of 55 quadratic forms without any proofs of course okay and later dickson proved that okay the ramanujan's claim is true for 54 quadratic forms except one quaternary quadratic form which one that one is x1 square plus 2x2 square plus 5x3 square plus 5x4 square why this is not true because this particular quadratic form can represent every in every positive integer except 15 so ramanujan only missed this particular number for this particular quadratic form so, and this is sort of the remarkable thing from ramanujan that that's what we believe from number theorists okay <clears throat> so let us now see how ramanujan thought this problem i mean how ramanujan attacked this problem so let us see that so consider a positive definite a diagonal quadratic form qx equal to ajx square which can be written in in this way right x transpose ax where a is the diagonal matrix basically diagonal matrix is a1 a2 a3 a4 are in the diagonal terms and the rest of the terms is zero so a is 4 cross 4 matrix 4 cross 4 symmetric diagonal matrix okay and uh, x is sorry this should be transpose here there should be a transpose so x is x1 x2 x3 x4 transpose okay now so okay so for the symmetricity 
one can assume that a1 is less than equals to a2 less than equals to a3 and less than equals to a4 right because like i mean suppose you have 2x1 square plus x2 square and same as it will be same as x1 square plus 2x2 square right so that's why you can take always you can take you can consider this kind of condition okay now let us see how ramanujan has thought this kind of problem i mean how ramanujan has given the complete list let us see first so uh, of course zero not equal to one everybody knows that so to represent one we have to take the quadratic form x square at least because if you i mean you, you, i mean we have to take a one equal to one why because if, if you take a one equal to two or three or so on so on then it cannot represent one right so a one must be equal to one okay so the corresponding so if you take a a one equal to one then the corresponding quadratic form will be x square right so x square can represent one now okay so the next number which x square cannot represent is 2 okay now our condition is a1 is less than equals to a2 and a2 is less than equals to a3 and so on so since a1 is less than a2 and so x square cannot represent 2 so we can take a2 as either 1 or 2 okay because because to represent 2 we i mean we have to take a2 at most i mean the the number i mean a2 should be at most 2 right so that's why we have to take a, 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 i mean a1 equal to 1 and a2 equal to 1 or a1 equal to 1 and a2 equal to 2 but and i mean for x i mean the corresponding uh, quadratic form will be x square plus y square and here the corresponding quadratic form will be x square plus 2 y square Great. Now, <clears throat> the quadratic from x square plus y square, one can see that the that the minimum number which it cannot represent is three. Okay. So we have to take a three is equal to three. I mean, a three is less than equals to three. So we can we have to take one 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 two and one one three. And similarly for one two, I mean x one square plus two x two square, the minimum number it cannot represent is five. So we have to take a3 equal to a 2, 3, 4, and 5, and so 2, 3, 4, and 5. And similarly, you can check that this quadratic form cannot represent 7, this quadratic form cannot represent 14, and so on. So in this way, you get the complete list of 55 quadratic forms. And this is sort of Ramanujan's idea. But unfortunately, in Ramanujan's paper, Ramanujan has written only two or three lines about this whole argument. But later, from Bhargava's paper, from Bhargava's escalation tree method. So this is basically an escalation tree. And from Bhargava's escalation tree method, we understood what exactly the Ramanujan wants to tell in his argument. Okay, so let us now move on. Yeah, any question here about this tree? Ah, okay. Uh, sorry, I could not see the chat. Ah, okay. Okay, so let me move on to the next slide. Ah, yeah, okay. Now, <clears throat> let us move on to the another generalization of Lagrange theorem. So consider a general quadratic form, sorry, not the Lagrange theorem, but the Ramanujan's theorem. I mean, I mean Dixon's theorem basically. So let us see the generalization of Dixon's theorem. So consider a general quadratic form qx equal to aij xi xj, which is basically x transpose x, where x is equal to xi transpose and a equal to aij be L cross L symmetric matrix. Then a is said to be an integer matrix if the off diagonal elements are integers. Okay. So in 1993, Conway and Schneeberger showed that in showed in an unpublished work, an unpublished manuscript, that a positive definite quaternary quadratic form. I mean, yeah. So the positive definite quadratic form with with integer matrix 
can represent every positive integer if and only if it represent every positive integer up to 50 okay so basically suppose you have so you have plenty number of quadratic forms so the theorem tells you to see that if the quadratic form is can represent every integer or not you just need to check only up to 15 i mean 1 2 3 4 up to 15 if a quadratic form can represent numbers up to 15 then it can represent every integer and this is sort of the very strong theorem in this area and this is known as 15 theorem and sometimes it is also known as finiteness theorem because it reduces an infinite check to finite one okay and later bhargava elegantly proved the 15 theorem with the escalation tree method in this paper actually okay so let us let me move on to our result now no sorry sorry <clears throat> let me move on to another generalization of lagrange theorem so variables so so suppose we take the variables so now so from now i mean up to now we have seen that lagrange theorem tells us that any number can be written as sum of four squares and those numbers are basically integers right so now what Bruden and Fubri has conjectured, Bruden and Fubri conjecture that okay, every sufficiently large integer n congruence to 4 mod 24 can be written as sum of four squares of primes. Now he has taken the, the subset of z, basically the, num, the prime numbers. And he has told that okay, any number which is congruence to 4 mod 24 can be represented as sum of four squares of primes. Okay. So let us now define, let me now define the definition of almost prime numbers. An almost prime of order R is a positive integer X with X equal to, suppose the prime factors are basically product over primes p to the power AP. And suppose it satisfies that sum of AP less than equals to R, then this X is called to be PR numbers. That is almost prime of order R. What does that mean? Suppose you take the number four. So four is basically two times two, right? So it is basically P2 number. Why? Because uh, two, two times two, so there are two, so, so there are two primes. So number of primes is less than equal to two. So you can say this is P2 number of, of course, uh, as well as P3 number, P4 number and so on. Suppose you take the number eight. So that will be two times two times two. So it, it will be P3 number, okay, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> In the same article, Pruden and Fubri proved that every sufficiently large integer in congruence to 4 mod 24 can be written as sum of four squares of P34 numbers. Okay. Okay. So recently, in the same section, Sang and Chow improved their above result and they have shown that every sufficiently large integer n congruence to 4 mod 24 can be written as sum of four squares of P4 numbers. And this is very strong result, right, in this direction. But there is a but that <clears throat> note that the above results are not exactly the generalization of Lagrange four squares theorem. Since we do not know what exactly means by the term sufficiently large, right? So, so let me give you an example here. So suppose you consider a number 1 million. And, and if, if I ask you that is it possible to write 1 million as a sum of four squares of primes or is it possible to write 1 million as a sum of four squares of P4 numbers from Zhang, Zhang and Zhao? No, of course not. Why? Because they are sufficiently large means a huge, huge number. And in fact, we cannot compute that number. What exactly sufficiently large is? So that's where our problem starts from. I mean, that's where our, we came up with an idea that we should, in, I mean, we should know what exactly mean by sufficiently large. Okay, so let me ask this question actually. So is it possible to find a set uh, containing, I mean, uh, is it possible? So one can ask that, is it possible to find a subset contained in Z uh, such that the equation that sum of four square equal to N is still solvable for every N where XJ belongs to beta for every J equal to one to three. Okay, so this is basically the 
question and okay so let me define one number which is called trs number <clears throat> so this is very similar to tr number just let me define it so we call an integer x is nearly almost prime of order r with respect to s this is basically the set s is the set so with respect to s or prs number if we can write x equal to this way so x is equal to product of p belongs to s p to the power a p and product over all the primes does not belongs to s p to the power p p then the second product that p does not belongs to s p to the power b p is a tr number that is summation of b p where p belongs to does not belongs to s less than equals to r okay so why so what is the importance here so basically what we want to say here with this definition that okay we basically leave some primes we basically leave some primes and for the other primes we basically we restrict the number of primes and i mean i mean we so inside the set s there are some primes and we basically ignore those primes those primes are exceptional primes suppose and we handle the primes which are not inside s and that primes i mean that that product should be pr number that's what it means okay so we denote the set prs number as prs this this i mean mathematical prs okay now we state our theorem so let s equal to 2 3 5 that is 2 3 and 5 are the prime numbers i mean 2 3 5 these primes belongs to s then for aj belongs to n and xj belongs to prs with r bigger than equal to 713 where j equal to 1 to 3 for the equation this is solvable for every m belongs to n if and only if it's it is solvable for every m less than equals to 15 so let us okay <clears throat> yeah so so basically what we have done here so we have generalized dickson's result in such a way that so if we consider uh, this diagonal quadratic form that aj x square so this can represent where xj is a prs number where r is bigger than equal to 730 i mean of course so P seven hundred and thirteen s is contained in P seven hundred and fourteen s, right? And contained in P seven hundred and fifteen s, and so on. So, if, if we can say the lower bound of R, that is our main target. Okay. So, for X J belongs to P R S, we can say that this equation is always solvable, if and only if this solve. I mean, if and only if it is solvable for every m less than equals to fifteen. and of course this generalizes dickson's result why this is dickson's result because uh, dickson's result tells us the dickson's result gives us particular 54 quadratic forms right that are universal i mean that can represent every integer and of course i mean that 54 quadratic form can represent that 54 quadratic forms are the only quadratic forms which can represent up to 15 which which can represent every integer up to 15 so uh, so from there also from that conclusion we, i mean from our theorem we can immediately conclude that okay so dickson's result in fact not only dickson's result our result also our result implies that this is always solvable when x belongs to pprs okay yeah so now as a corollary we have obtained that for a equal to 2 3 and 5 every integer is a sum of four squares of P seven hundred and thirteen s numbers, and these have a corollary generalizes similarly Lagrange's four squares theorem. Why? Uh, because <clears throat> yeah, and this this generalizes Lagrange's theorem because any number can be represented as sum of four squares of P seven hundred thirteen s numbers. Okay. So these are the uh, these are the whole stuff uh, sort of stuff from our side. Now let me go to the proof. So any questions here? Uh, up to now oh so there is one question from ajit uh, ikbal singh that as a katres has work on wearing problem for matrices do you study your problem for matrices no actually not because we don't know much about wearing's problem uh, <clears throat> 
so i will show so in the proof of our work you can see that we have used basically used modular forms and sort of stuff so we are mainly interested in the quadratic forms thing not in the wedding problem so that's why we have not still yeah seen that that work actually thank you yeah thanks okay <clears throat> so this okay so let me move on to our proof um just a second yeah <clears throat> so let qx equal to summation j from 1 to 4 ajx is square where x is x1 x2 x3 x4 and aj belongs to n and let s equal to 2 3 5 just recalling the stuff and let a be the set x belongs to z4 such that qx equal to m qx means this qx like summation of ajx square equal to m okay Great. So let S A Z be the set, which is basically the subset of A, where we are taking uh, those x, I mean those vectors, such that if P divides X J, this implies either P belongs to S or P is bigger than equal to Z. Okay. Okay. Great. Now, so let us see one interesting fact that for Z equal to m to the power one by fourteen and one four two six. I mean fourteen hundred and twenty six. Cardinality of S A Z is bigger than zero, where m is bigger than equal to seven seven to the power fourteen hundred and twenty six. And this statement is equivalent to the statement of our theorem. So let us see that. So let us first re first recall our statement again. Okay, just to make sure why I am saying that. so we are saying in our theorem we are we are specifically saying that that aj x j square i mean this sum where x j belongs to prs so x j is a prs number this sum is solvable i mean we are studying this kind of equation with x j belongs to prs and when this is solvable that's that's what we are studying okay So let us see that what we are doing here. So as a S A Z is basically this, and we will restrict from uh, okay. So let me say one more inter one more fact that okay. So our theorem is the generalized sort of generalization of Conway-Slingworth's result, right? I mean the fifteen theorem because in the fifteen theorem they have proved for any integer. I mean x j belongs to z. I mean their theorem states that x j belongs to z but in our theorem we have proved that okay it should not need to be x j belongs to z we can take the subset of z so x j belongs to prs and that r should be bigger than equal to 713 and that's what i will show you why this is same as this statement okay so finally we want to show this thing and why this is same so for m is less than 7 to the power 426 xj must be a p 713s number why because if xj is not belongs to this number for some j there exist at least 714 primes p bigger than equal to 7 for which p dividing xj right because xj does not belongs to this that means what that means xj must be either p 714s number or 715s number and so on so that means what that means uh, p must so for p bigger than equal to 7 p must divide xj which has 714 primes so therefore xj must be bigger than equal to 7 to the plus 714 cool now this implies that the representation qx equal to m we have m equal to sum of aj x square Which is basically bigger than equal to x j square, and which is bigger than equal to seven to the power four hundred and twenty six. Why? Because x j is seven to the power seven hundred and fourteen whole square. So this is seven hundred and seven to the power fourteen twenty six, and which leads to the contradiction. Why? Because we have taken m is less than seven to the power fourteen twenty six. So this is not possible, of course. So I mean, this is possible, of course. I mean, this is automatically done. Okay. Now. let us see the next part like why 
this is sufficient to prove that most mod s z is bigger than zero for z equal to this and m is bigger than this. Okay, so let x belongs to s z and oh and we write suppose so x is basically the vector and we write each individual term of the vector x j is equal to p belongs to s p to the power a p j times p does not belongs to s and p bigger than equal to z p to the power b p j because x j x belongs to s z right so x must satisfy this condition also that p belongs to s and p does not belongs to z p bigger than equal to z so from there we can write in this way good then of course we have that so since p bigger than equal to z and p, p to the power b p j is the thing so we can write so you can take the lower bound of this i mean we can bound p by z right so that's why we can get z to the power summation of bpj okay now since aj x square equal to m so we have an additional restriction that x j square must be less than equals to m okay now setting z equal to m to the power 1 by 1426 we can thus conclude that M to the power fourteen hundred and twenty one by fourteen and twenty six summation of so this is basically Z, right? We have taken Z equal to this. So now just came back to this line. Now just come back to this line. So Z is M to the power fourteen twenty six times summation B P J. This must be less than equal to this thing. So this is P not belongs to S and P bigger than equal to Z. This is Z P to the power B P J. And this is Not only so, this is basically less than equal to xj, since yeah, since xj belongs to SSZ, and this is less than equals to m to the power half, and so from there you can immediately conclude that summation of BPJ is less than equal to seven hundred and thirteen. This implies xj belongs to P seven hundred and thirteen s, and that's it. So we have proved that our statement is same as this statement. So this is en enough to show that. the cardinality of ssz is bigger than 0 for m bigger than equal to 7 to the power 1426 for z equal to m to the power 1 by 1426 okay let me move to the saving argument so the goal here is to show for z equal to just just the repetition of statement just i have written it here that for z equal to m to the power 1 by 1426 cardinality of ssz is bigger than 0 where m is bigger than equal to 7 to the power 1426 Let uh, d be the vector d1, d2, d3, d4, where dJs are square-free and GCD of dJ and 30 is one for each j. Why this 30 came up here? So this 30 came up from the set S. So I mean S contains the primes two, three, and five, right? So two times three times five is 30, and we want those dJs whose GCD with those primes are basically one. Okay. So now, <coughs> let x congruent to zero mod d denotes the simultaneous conditions that x j congruent to zero mod d j, and consider the set A D. This is basically <coughs> x belongs to A. I mean the preliminary set x belongs to A. X congruent to zero mod d. That means x one congruent to zero mod d one, x two congruent to zero mod d two, and so on. X x four congruent to zero mod d four. And by the natural bijection. you can write this set as in this way like x belongs to z to the power 4 summation j from 1 to 4 aj dj square xj square equal to m because because you you can write it like because because x1 is divisible by d1 x2 is divisible by d2 and x4 is divisible by d4 so just write your x1 as d1 x1 x2 as d2 x2 x3 as d3 x3 and x4 as d4 x4 and that's it that's what i have written here Okay, so for ease of notation, set P seven Z is equal to product over all the primes, where primes lies between seven and Z. Thus, we can write S Z as this way that X belongs to A with G C D of X J and P seven Z is equal to one. Okay, so these two are same actually. So so let us see first here. So S Z is what S Z is X belongs to A. Such that p belong p divides x j implies p belongs to s or p bigger than equal to z. What does this means? This means that the primes from starting from seven and less than z that primes cannot divide x j. That 
that means the gcd of those primes with x j should be 1 right that's what i have written here that's what i have written here that gcd of x j and p7 z where p7 z is the product of primes that gcd is equal to 1 where for j from 1 to 3 okay now from the standard basic inclusion exclusion principle tells us that cardinality of s z can be written in this way i mean it it follows quite easily just the matter of the calculation so you can write it you can write this cardinality as in, in this fashion where mu is the mobius function which can be defined in this way okay <clears throat> but so basically here so what we want to show so let us see here we want to show that for m bigger than 7 to the power 1 by 14 26 yes something like that a uh, cardinality of ssz should be bigger than zero right and to bound to get the lower bound of ssz now the next i mean the the next task is to find the cardinality of ad right and the main hurdle here is to estimate the main hurdle in this whole work is to estimate the cardinality of the set ad because otherwise we mainly use the sieving sieving technique those were very standard sort of standard thing in the final step after estimating the above cardinality we introduce rosser weights which is sort of standard and apply standard combinatorial sieve techniques to deduce the result so you can so you, you can find this combinatorial sieve technique in the book of e panwech and kolsky analytic number theory okay so let me now move on to the fact i mean where we use i mean let me now show the steps where uh, how to find the cardinality of ad okay so for that i need some preliminaries from modular forms so let me just start that so co consider the set gamma n that is the matrix is 2 to plus 2 matrix in sl to z where a congruent to b congruent to 1 mod n and b congruent to c congruent to 0 mod n a set gamma contained in sl to z is said to be congruent subgroup of level n if there exists some natural number n such that gamma n contained in gamma okay this is very standard definition and for for example one can consider the set gamma 0n so th th this is clearly the subset i mean so clearly the gamma n is subset of gamma 0n so you can say gamma 0n is a congruent subgroup of level n right because there is a additional restriction in gamma n okay <clears throat> so let h be the complex upper half plane so h is z belongs to c where imaginary part of z is bigger than 0 so we define modular form of weight k level n the dirichlet character chi and multiplier system epsilon to be a holomorphic function f which satisfies this equation which satisfy this property sorry this property that f of z plus d y z plus d is equal to this for all gamma equal to abcd belongs to gamma 0 n okay and satisfy the additional technical condition that fz is holomorphic at all its boundary values such that q in q in an infinity okay a modular form f is said to be a cusp form if it vanishes at all the boundary values okay so it is standard notation to let mk and chi respectively s n chi to denote c vector space of modular forms respectively cusp forms of weight k level n and character chi and we call epsilon gamma k so what we used here epsilon gamma k here so this epsilon gamma k is known to be trivial multiplier system if epsilon gamma k equal to, when for k k belongs to z epsilon gamma k equal to 1 and the theta multiplier system for epsilon gamma k equal to this if k k no not belongs to z that means k is a half integer basically so for k half integer epsilon gamma k will be this okay where epsilon d is 1 when d congruent to 1 mod 4 and i d congruent to sorry this, this will be 3 mod 4 sorry i am extremely sorry this will be 3 mod 4 okay and this is kronecker legendre jacobi symbol as an example of modular form one can consider the standard eisenstein series for k bigger than 2 which is given by gk chao is equal to half times this this is this is very well known function and this belongs to mk and here n is equal to 1 and chi is equal to 1 i mean in this space if you consider n equal to 1 and chi equal to 1 then gk tau belongs to this space okay where uh, b2k is the 2k 
Bernoulli number and sigma k minus one m is the divisor function. Generalized divisor function. And so on. Okay. So it is well known that any modular form f belongs to m k n chi can be written as f equal to Eisenstein series plus cast form, where E is the Eisenstein series of weight k on gamma zero n with an event type of sky and C belongs to S K N chi. That means the same way on gamma zero n with event type of sky. And the, this result is sort of interesting result, and we have used this result in, in our proof also that F can be written as the Eisenstein series part plus the Kasparov. Okay, so let us see that now. So okay, so let me now define theta function, which is very important. Uh, there are two. Okay, so just a second. Uh, I have to quite often my question is suggestion in this guide. What about quadratic forms with diagonal matrices? Sorry, I do not know about the matrix things with uh, quadratic forms because I have not studied that way. So I'm uh, oh, oh, uh, with try diagonal. Okay, try diagonal matrices, particular bandwidth matrices. This is Gilbert's term. Okay, I I, I no, no no exactly. Actually, I have not seen that way. Sorry about okay. that. So, Swamirup, uh, yeah. ma'am, uh, ma'am just gives uh, comments and uh, you know suggestions, so you can okay. just consider them later. At least. I see, I see, I see, I see. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. I, I, I thought this is okay. Okay, I, I thought this is the question about my talk. Actually, sorry. It, it, you see, um, it, uh, you are right. Sigma a i j x i x j. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The matrix a i j is important to you. And right, right. Different forms I'm writing for diagonal. It is some of the squares. For others, it is some of the product, and bandwidth would restrict the product. That yes, is all. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, okay. Bandwidth will restrict the product. Okay, okay. I, I see, I see, I see. I see, I see. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank Welcome you. and all the best. You are doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so let me complete my talk. Just a second. Yeah. So uh, let Q x. So let me now define theta function here. Associated to the quadratic form. So let Q x equal to a i j x i x j be any positive definite quadratic form with L variables, and where a i j belongs to n and x is x one x two x l. Let a q be the symmetric L cross L matrix over Z whose entries satisfy a q i j equal to a i j for i less than j and a q i i is equal to two a i. So basically, the diagonal times are diagonal terms are two times a i i, and the and the rest of the octagonal Terms are symmetric sort. Thus, we can write qx equal to half x transpose a qx. Sorry, yeah. We denote the absolute value of the discriminant of q by delta q, which can be defined as delta q equal to determinant of the matrix a q. And the level of the quadratic form q is defined to be the smallest integer n q belongs to n such that n q a q inverse belongs to a m l z, where m l z is basically the integer matrix. With all the diagonal entries of n q a q inverse are equal. Okay, so I have very less time now, so let me go a little bit faster. So let R q m be the number of solutions to q x equal to m for x belongs to settle z to the power l for tau belongs to upper half plane and q equal to e to the power two pi i tau. The theta function associated to the quadratic form q can be defined in this way. So. Theta q is basically the generating function of R q m, where R q m is the number of solution of q x equal to m. And this and this equality is very trivial. Just you have to interchange by the definition of R q m and and this sum. Then you can get this thing. So theta q is so theta q is the generating function of R q m. Okay. So let me now see the next show you the next result that. Is sort of very interesting thing that for any positive definite quadratic form Q over Z in L variables with level n Q, theta Q is the associated theta function is the modular form of weight L y two and level n Q. This n Q, I mean the level of the modular form theta Q, is same as the level of the quadratic form Q. That is sort of interesting, and the number of variables of Q. Is if if the number of variable is l, then the weight of this theta function will be l by two. That's it. And this character is this one, which is dependent on delta. Q. Okay. Then this is sort of the standard result in 
in the branch of quadratic forms and modular i mean i mean i mean the bridge of quadratic forms and modular forms okay the theta function also similar to modular i mean theta function is since theta function is the modular form so the th theta function naturally decomposes as the existence series part and the cuspidal part where eq is the existence series series of weight l by 2 on gamma 0 n with lemon type of sky and fq is also the cusp form of weight same weight on gamma 0 n of lemon type of sky okay the interesting fact here is that it turns out that the mth coefficient aem I mean, the mth coefficient AEM of EQ, I mean, the mth coefficient of EQ grows much faster than the mth coefficient of FQ for L bigger than or equal to 3. And that sort of helps us. Why? Because therefore, EQ, that sort of helps us in that, in the way that, suppose, so you can write RQN, I mean, the, the function RQN is equal to AEM plus fqm right i mean aem plus afm okay so aem behaves as the main term of rqm and afm behaves as the error term of rqm why because i assistance series grows much faster than the faster than the cuspidal form cusp form in particular for our purpose to compute the cardinality of the set ad we consider the quadratic form qdx equal to aj dj square xj square right why we consider that? Because AD is the set of those quadratic, so these quadratic forms equal to M, I mean the, the number of solution of these quadratic forms. Okay. So QDX is equal to this, and we have that mod AD is AEDM plus AFDM, right? Where AEDM is the mth coefficient of the Eisenstein series, and AFDM is the mth coefficient of acid cusp, and which provide the main term and AA term really respectively. So let us now quickly see in one slide how to compute the existence series part, I mean the main term and how to compute the error term in just one slide. Okay, so the local representation density for LRE quadratic form Q at M can be defined by the limit in this way, where RQ P to the power, P to the power R M is basically the cardinality of the set. Okay, <clears throat> so Siegel around 1935 established that the Fourier coefficient AEM associated to Q, I mean the Eisenstein uh, series coefficient, right? Eisenstein series coefficient associated to Q can be expressed as an infinite product, infinite local product of beta QPM. So AEM can be written as product of beta QPM. So what it turns out to us is that to compute AEM, we need to compute beta QPM at every prime P. And that's what we have done in, in our calculus. Calculation. So we mainly calculate the local representation densities for QD at every prime P and finally apply Ziegel's theorem to compute AD. What about the cuspidal part calculation? So for the cuspidal part calculation, we have the result from schwartz pillow and E. Ernest. schwartz pillow and Ernest constructed an explicit orthonormal basis of Hecke eigenforms for the space SKN guy. And that's sort of our idea that we can therefore, I mean, this is not our, our idea, this is very old, old idea, that we can write our cusp form as a linear combination of Hecke eigenforms. And finally, for the Hecke eigenforms, we can use, we use the famous Tellin's bound that AFM is bounded by GN, right? I mean, the Pfizer function. So we next use the famous Tellin's bound to get the upper bound of AFDN. So, and in this direction, we have found that for, for the quadratic form with, with, for the quadratic form QD with level N and discriminant delta, we bound AFDM is less, less than equal to this thing. And this is sort of the error term of mod AD. So this is sort of a error term of mod AD and we get the main term from the existence series part. And that's how we have to calculate the cardinality of AD and finally, we just use the saving technique to calculate mod SZ, the cardinality of SZ is bigger than zero. Okay, so that completes the proof. Now, uh, let me show you what is our plan next. What is the plan? So let X set, so let me define polygonal number. So the X set M number is the number of lattice points used to make up a regular M gon. 
So it can be written, so x is an immunal number, can be written by the formula that n minus 2x square minus n minus 4x by 2. Okay, so for example, one can consider triangular numbers, square numbers, that p3, 1, 1, p4, 1, 1, and p3, 2 is 3, you can see quite clearly that p4, 2 is 4, and so on. Okay, so that is the thing. So this is the definition of x is an immunal number. So in this direction, so for the collector particular numbers, <clears throat> around 1638, Harmer conjecture that every natural number n can be written as sum of at most m angular numbers. Okay. And so of course, Lagrange four square theorem basically solves Harmer's number, Harmer's particular number conjecture for m equal to four, right? Because why? Uh, because let us see it here. So if you put m equal to four here, suppose you put m equal to four in this formula, okay? So you will get what? Two x square minus two x square by two. So that is basically x square, right? Okay. If m equal to four, so p four x is x square. So you can see here that for m equal to so x is so what Lagrange has proved that any number can be written as sum of four squares. So that's what exactly Fermat's conjecture for m equal to four, right? That any number can be written as four to t four numbers, right? This is same as uh, Lagrange four square theorem. Okay, Gauss solved the case for m equal to three in his Eureka theorem, and finally the full conjecture was resolved by Cauchy around eighteen thirty. Okay, now in this direction, Guy proposed. I mean, Richard Guy has proposed a very interesting question that is it possible to find the optimal answer of the Fermat's polygonal number theorem? That is, so if you consider the sum j from 1 to L PMXJ is equal to n, then for which L? I mean, if there exists any optimal L, like the, the minimum L, such that this sum is always solvable? That is the question. So, of course, from Cauchy's theorem, you can say that L is less than equals to M, right? Because sum of N M angular number will always can always represent every integer. So, L must be less than equals to M. Now, the question is how much less? That is the question. And Guy in the same paper, I mean, Richard Guy in the same paper has proved that, okay, the, the lower bound of L is M minus 4 for m bigger than or equal to 8. And Cauchy's theorem tells us that L is less than or equal to m. So Cauchy's theorem and Gauss theorem, sorry, Guy's theorem and Cauchy's theorem leaves a small gap between this upper and lower bound of L. And finally, we have found the true answer lying inside this gap. So our upper theorem precisely states that L is exactly equal to m minus 4 for m bigger than or equal to 8, and L is equal to 3 for m 3, 5, 6, and 4 for m belongs to Four and seven. Okay, so what is our future plan? So future plan is basically one of the goal of this project is to generalize Harmer's polygonal number theorem to the restricted subset xj belongs to PR. So basically to apply sieve theory and modular form technique to find that if if there exists some if the sum of m m molar number can represent every integer for xj belongs to PR for some R. So that is our first question. And the second question is quite similar that if you consider the weighted immunal sum, like summation of j from 1 to m, aj, pm, xj, then is it possible to find the lower bound inner such that this is solvable for every n, if and only it, solves, it is solvable for n less than equals to n, with xj belongs to here. And that is our goal. Okay, with this, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Shomuru, for a very nice talk. Are there any questions? <clears throat> okay, so I have just one comment that uh, Shomuru did not say this, but this paper has just been accepted for publication in Transactions of the American Mathematical Society. <laughs> it's in press, so it will come very soon. Yeah, it's very interesting to see how uh, uh, this idea starting from the work of Ramanujan Dixon and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, so Ramanujan's idea is quite interesting because so Argova has got the idea from Ramanujan's idea. 
so bhargava is also very talented person in that way because ramanuja <laughs> in his paper has written only two or three lines and nobody at that point has understood what exactly ramanuja wants to say dickson has proved his theorem in different approach not from ramanujan's approach actually completely different approach mm. oh okay nice yeah. any other question or comment so if not uh, let us thank shomuru again for a nice talk so thank you thanks a lot so we'll be meeting again uh, next to next thursday with another speaker so just in case there is somebody who would want to uh, subscribe to the mailing list so that you get to know about various talks forthcoming talk uh, please let us know we'll be happy to put you in the mailing list yeah okay see you all thank you